Aloha. Hi, I'm Chris Leith. I'm here with Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, today we're going to be doing a show uh, talking about uh, Hawaii and uh, geo uh, geophysics and planetology. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Lucy. Uh, Dr. Paul Lucy, thank you for being on Think Tech Hawaii. Nice well, to have you on the show today. Uh, thanks for having me on the show, Chris. Yeah, okay. Well, I got a call from Jay this morning. Apparently, he was a little under the weather because I know how much he really wanted to be here and chat with you today. So, but uh, he asked me to come in and, and chat. Although I know very little about planetology or geophysics, um, I'm, I'm, I love the topic. It sounds like a very interesting area of research. Yeah, it's great. You can be the student. Yes, good, great. That's, that's what exactly where I need to be today. Um, so, um, planetary science um, is an interesting area, and I kind of, when I think of planetary science, I think of Big Bang Theory. You know, these right, guys right. that are running around uh, uh, with their uh, Star Wars outfits on and, and, uh, and such, and um, I'm thinking that's got to be a very cool world to live in, and you meet really interesting and exotic people. Yeah, yeah and, and that show is not that different from our <laughs> everyday life. They have a couple scientists living with an engineer. Mm -hmm. We often don't live together, but <laughs> we, uh, we work together. Uh, and uh, so the, the business of planetary science is exploring the other planets, typically uh -huh. with robotic spacecraft, someday with astronauts again. Uh, those of us of a certain age remember the Apollo astronauts. That's right. My uh, my grandfather actually built the landing gear for the Apollo space mission. Really? He did. That's, yeah. that's terrific. He lived in Huntsville, Alabama. Yeah, yes. that's terrific. Uh -huh, the, yeah. the lunar module. That's right. Well, we still, in our institute, we still use samples that were returned by the Apollo astronauts uh -huh. uh, virtually every day. Wow. So they, they're, they're, uh, the in data compression value of a piece of rock brought from another planet is unbelievable. So is that right? We can learn things at the atomic level now that, that uh, just rewards us hugely when we bring back a sample. Well, when you, when, you, when you do this kind of work, when you talk about planetary science, maybe you could give people sort of a general description of what planetary science is about, what the focus of it is. And yeah, the, 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 for planetary science, is basically the understanding the origin and the evolution of planets in the solar system including comets and asteroids. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the planets form? Well, uh, what, did they, what did they do after they formed? I got that figure. I read the Bible. It says that they were formed in a day. In a day? Well, it was a long day. But I think day. it was a long day. <laughs> that was a long day. So we, uh, yeah. we think that you know, the, star, uh, the sun was formed from a, a, a cloud of, of interstellar gas mm -hmm. and dust. Um, and as this, when the sun lit up, it blew most of the gas and dust away, but there was mm -hmm. uh, remaining material that collected to form planets. There's a lot of details in there. We learn a lot of uh, information from meteorites, which uh, are kind of the leftover building blocks. Right. Uh, so we study those. To well, meteorites are, are, are interesting because now my question with the meteorite, and I, I don't know if other people have, have posed this question to you, but um, you know, when I think of meteorites coming into our solar system, they're coming from external areas. Right. Uh, and they come into our solar system, or are there sort of intra -meteor meteorites or intra solar system? Well, almost all of the meteorites and some giant proportion of the mass is from inside the solar system. Most meteorites come from what's called the asteroid belt. Okay. So it's a belt of material between Mars and Jupiter where the t there was a, a planet might have formed there. Um, except that Jupiter was so massive it, massive, it prevented the planet forming process. But there's still lots of leftovers there. Right. They uh, interact with each other, and they uh, get shot in towards the inner solar system, Is and they this fall on the because Earth. because of gravitational forces? Right, right. Okay. Principally, the smaller ones are actually influenced by radiation from the sun, kind of a, a strange process where they get they're spinning in space. They get yes. heated up on one side, but they radiate the heat on the back side, and that pushes, for, forms a little force that tends to move small objects like the size of basketballs up to meter-sized objects around in the inner solar system. Oh. When they're big, they don't feel that, but the small ones kind of rocket around, and they can move quite a bit in the, er, around in the inner solar system. And we ended up finding them on exotic places like uh, the South Polar Ice Cap is uh -huh. a great place to look for meteorites. And many of our people in our institute go down there to, to look for meteorites. Is that because they get embedded into the ice and are sort of preserved in, a, in some kind of useful state? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is when you uh, drop a rock on an ice cap, it's really easy to see. Yeah, well, it's very visual. Yeah, isn't so it? you've got a white <laughs> background and there's a, there's a, a black rock there. Uh -huh. So that's one thing. The other is that the, the meteorites fall on the ice cap 
uh, in certain places, the ice flows and um, it, the, it evaporates in place. So it tends to concentrate the meteorites in these in pretty dense deposits. Oh. So, um, oh, but these have been happening over time. But over just sort of hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah, and then, but over time what happens is the ice sort of pushes them into a... Yeah, the ice flows. It's uh -huh. a glacier, giant glacier, uh -huh. and it flows up against certain places. It flows up against a mountain, uh -huh. and there the dry wind in Antarctica can actually cause the ice to evaporate, but it leaves the, the, the meteorites behind. So that's a great place to go to look for, look wow, for meteorites. Wow, that, that just sounds fascinating. Who, who discovers this, this kind of stuff? I mean, do people actually have to take expeditions? Uh, yeah, there's, to, to there's, uh, there's programs, both uh, international and uh, the Japanese have a, a program to go to Greenland and to Antarctica mm -hmm. to look for meteorites. They go every year, they, they get volunteers, mostly it's scientists who want to have the, the fun of being out there on a snowmobile. I, I can't even imagine how exciting that is, being in sub-zero weather. I mean, yeah. sub-sub-zero <laughs> weather. Yeah. It is summer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, yeah. anybody want to volunteer? Yeah. You're volunteering. You're yeah, <laughs> yeah living, in, living in a tent for, uh -huh. with a roommate for six weeks yeah. when the sun never goes down. Is, uh, <laughs> and you've got to pack out all of your waste of every possible That's kind. That's right. That's so right. Wow. Uh, yeah. In the old days, they used to not pack out all the waste, and occasionally people would return meteorites that weren't meteorites. Uh. So they've decided that they're not going to do that anymore. They're <laughs> not going to do that any yeah, longer. Yeah. You take it with yeah. you. Oh, my God. Yeah. I don't want to know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, now you've been doing, how long have you been doing this? Uh, since 1975, so that's all. So when you were like 12. Know. Like, uh, like that. I wish. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, I worked for a, uh, a professor in planetary science uh -huh. in college, and I've been doing it ever since. In fact, I still work with that guy. Uh, so, um, oh, that's amazing. It's been 35 years, wow, or almost yeah. 40 years. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So yeah. you guys have been working together all these years. So you really kind of know what know what each other knows. Well, you know, we have a community of a man. It might be a couple thousand scientists and uh, mm -hmm. and. We have meetings frequently. A lot of you know, we have big literature we review, so we have a you know it's a very lively uh, uh, bunch of people, and it's really really a fun business to be in. Well, the thing that I I mean we hear a lot of issues around global warming and the discussion back and yeah. forth between Republicans and Democrats whether it's yeah. real or it's not real or if it's man-made or if it's caused by natural forces of of and sort of cycles of the Earth and the Sun and so on and. And we hear all this, th these arguments that are being made. Some of them are politicized. Some of them are, are truly based on, on data. Yeah. But data changes over time. Yeah. But this is a, it's not changing at random in this case. Mm -hmm. I mean, from a, if you look back in time over, say, the last million years, there have been, there's been about 200 to 250 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Right. Well, today there's 400. We've almost doubled it in an incredibly short amount of time, about a little less than 100 years. So the atmospheric, you know, from a planetary science standpoint, this is a fantastic experiment because we've taken a really powerful heat-trapping gas. Mm -hmm. We've doubled it in the atmosphere. If we could live a thousand right. years, it would be great to see what happens. We know something is going to happen. The, the idea that putting all that heat-trapping gas in the atmosphere and it's going to do nothing is, it's just, crazy. I so mean, now it's is just there, not, not correct. So I guess the, the big question in my thought, my, my thought process is, is there, is there a way to reverse it? Is it reversible? And as, in as quickly as we created it, can we as quickly reverse that? Well, you just think about where we, we, we burn all of this uh, fuel in our cars. Mm -hmm. What kind of a process could you imagine to pump all that CO2 back into the ground at the same rate that we pulled it out? Mm -hmm. You've got the, the oil and gas industry is uh, doing their best to pull it out to supply what we're asking them to do mm -hmm. at as fast as they can. Well, we would have to ask them to put it back in the ground as fast as they can. Well, we can't, we can't convert it. We, is there no conversion process from CO2 to convert that into something more useful? Um, you, there, are, there are ways of, of collecting CO2 and, say, pumping it underground where it reacts with rocks and it become, becomes more stable. Mm -hmm. But the, the volume is really kind of staggering. When you take a coast-to-coast -coast flight, you you personally are generating a couple of tons of CO2 just sitting in the seat. So someone would have to have the motivation, not just the technology, but mm -hmm. the motivation to take that waste product and go bury it. 
was that you would need some kind of a planetary scale landfill. Mm -hmm. Now, if we, if we ramp down our CO2 production, over time the oceans will soak up that CO2. And the problem we have there is it causes the oceans to become more acidic, and we see that in Hawaii, it's cause, it's causing coral bleaching. Well, we do see the coral bleaching here. Coral bleaching, um, and, and in the uh, Pacific Northwest, they have trouble raising oysters because mm -hmm. the, they're, the, they have trouble producing their cells, uh, I mean their shells, from because of the uh, acidity in the water. So it's a, it's a, it's a quite a, a serious problem. But you know, we just had this climate conference, and it looks like the world's coming around and. And I think the U.S. Will, will come around, too. Well, I think, you know, China, India, the United States, some of the, the larger industrial powers yeah. of the world are probably the worst offenders. Yeah, and, and it's, in fact, this year was the first year where the global CO2 rate of, uh, did not go up. So it actually plateaued in terms of, of how fast we're putting CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay. So it's conceivable that, you know, we're seeing a turnaround. Um, you know, there, there's this huge growth in renewables, and, and people are worried about this. And so, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm optimistic that that we can turn this around. But there's no way to there's no way to restore the balance within you know 10 lifetimes to, to where 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 it was. Uh, so we're you're going to around 250. Oh yeah, that's just not that. We're not going to see that for many generations. So there's no way to sort of bleed it off into space, or not that anybody has. Proposed. Developed yet? Because yeah. obviously, if somebody solves this problem. They they win the big Nobel Peace they Prize. They would they would win the big the big prize. Yes, yes. Yeah. And if there was something like a carbon tax or cap and trade, that that uh, the person who comes up with that technology would be in, in really good shape. Well, we also know that there are issues with, for example, I was I lived in Indonesia for a couple of years. Yeah. In Indonesia, they were burning the rainforest like crazy. Yeah. yeah. Singapore was complaining about the the pollution coming off of that. But that also, but there's also lots of factors associated with that as well because once you burn that off the underlying soil starts to produce starts to produce uh, methane gas I think it's yeah, methane starts yeah, to come yeah. out of that right that, now methane is different than co2 it's a it's a worse greenhouse gas it ha traps out ha traps heat even more effectively the, okay then than CO2, CO2. the one small upside in methane is its lifetime in the atmosphere is pretty short so in you know in a hundred years the methane you you emit today is just gone. It's it consumed by, by chemical processes in the in the environment. Okay, so that's actually not a bad thing in yeah. terms of CO two is going to take much longer. Yeah, to, the only way that doesn't react, it just it has to uh -huh. be absorbed by the oceans and then it, it precipitates in minerals at the uh -huh. bottom bottom. So of the now ocean. we're having sort of a geeky talk here, but CO two yeah, versus yeah. carbon monoxide. Car CO2 is CO, uh, carbon dioxide. Right. And carbon monoxide, which of course we've known to be quite... Uh, is toxic. Toxic. Yeah. Uh, we were, our cars were burning carbon monoxide for a long, long time. We well, switched over to catalytic converters, then we went to carbon dioxide? Well, the, the CO... Uh, cars still produce a little bit of CO, um, still yet. Uh -huh. um, but they, uh, th that has not been a big problem for a long time. It was the nitrous oxide that was, was the catalytic converters got, got rid of. So oh, that's okay. that's uh, in the engine. You know, nitrogen's part of the air. It gets in there and it and it it gets gets heated up and it produces these nitrous oxides, which are also a greenhouse gas, wow. but also bad for people's health. So that's why they, it was bad for smog and that kind of thing. Well, this is sort of an I mean, it sort of seems like a timely conversation considering all the pollution issues going on in the world today. But I think when we come back from the, our commercial, we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing uh, in planetology and commercialization and such. Sure. Uh, so we'll talk about that when we come back. I'm, I'm Chris Letham, and uh, stay tuned. This is Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll be right back. Aloha. Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at Think Tech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Justina Spiritu, and I'm the co-host of Hawaii Farmers Series. This is my co-host, Matthew Johnson, and you can catch us every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. What do we talk about, Matt? So on Hawaii Farmers Series, we're going to be bringing on the farmers and also supporter of farmers, including restaurants, caterers, as well as government supporters and nonprofits to hear their background stories 
and understanding our local ag community just a little bit better. Yeah, essentially there's a lot more that goes into farming and the local food community beyond just producing the food. And we want to feature and get the background story on all these folks and see how we all work together as a community. So join us every Thursday. Aloha. Hi, welcome back. I'm Chris Leatham uh, here at the Tech Hawaii. And today we're talking about sensors and research with our guest, Dr. Paul Lucy. Um, Dr. Paul Lucy, we were talking a little bit about you know, sort of the issues with uh, some of the environmental pollutant issues and so on. But you're also doing some interesting research with NASA. Yeah. And we're not sending as many astronauts. We're trying to figure out ways to do it more efficiently rather than just sending up astronauts. So you're helping to develop systems that are miniaturized, uh, operate on low power. Right. So one of the, the research areas that we work on at UH is to try to take existing techniques for sensing chemicals at a distance, mm -hmm. but do it with much lower power, much lower mass, because it's so expensive to say, mm -hmm. send something into space. Right. See, unlike politicians who we don't want to be low power, in this case we <laughs> want, or low energy, we no, want this to be so. low energy, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, well, we don't want to be losers either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Well, you're doing yeah. interesting work. Now, miniaturization, of course, has got to be an ongoing challenge, and we're using processors. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, pro you know, uh, companies like Intel and such are yeah. developing more interesting processors with more mathematical capabilities all the time. Yeah. Uh, they're faster, smaller, uh, less prone to heat issues. I suppose heat's probably a consideration. Oh yeah, all, all of the all the problems we we uh, technical problems we have with miniaturized electronics on the Earth, it, it's the same in space and and worse. Mm -hmm. So we've been we've been riding that technological wave. So we take the the toolkit the giant technology is providing, uh, for example, um, infrared cameras that used to be the size of old time studio televisions that's right. are now down the kind of size that you can incorporate in your cell phone. Well, that's the kind of technology we incorporate into instruments that we uh, we'd like to send into space. Now you had uh, you had sent some stuff up into space pre a spectrometer with uh, a previous mission. Yeah, the, well, the, the mission unfortunately is now ex exploring the bottom of the ocean, but uh -huh. we're an oceanographic institute, so that's a, that's <laughs> that's a okay. win. The rocket didn't quite work, but that's, that's okay. But we're, uh -huh. we're following that on with, uh, with uh, a follow-on instrument. We learned a lot of, inst uh, a lot of lessons in, in developing that, and so we're aiming that as at an Earth-orbiting mission to, to be uh, mapping the kinds of minerals and, and other aspects uh, of the Earth's surface um, for NASA. Okay. Yeah. And what's the benefit, or what's sort of the end game with all that type of technology? With that type of technology, what are you? What What do we see as potentially a benefit to this kind of information or knowledge? Well, this is a this is kind of a Google Earth writ large. You know, it, it, pretty much anybody understands the value of being able to to do imagery. Uh, at very high resolution, mm -hmm. what w uh, what we're doing for NASA is trying to add that chemical analysis uh, aspect on top of it. So we could, for example, um, measure emissions from smokestacks. Um, we can do that with with power companies. They might want to know how much uh, they're putting out. Um, or we in the past we've worked with uh, Dow Chemical where we surveyed a very large petrochemical plant in Houston. So this is tracking volatile organic compound emissions? That, that's one of the applications. The, okay. the other is uh, monitoring how dust moves around on the surface of the Earth. Scientific applications, uh, civil applications include uh, uh, water temperature mapping. Um, we do a project here where, uh, with the geology department where we measure groundwater that gets put out, uh, out on shore because it's cooler, so we can see that groundwater. So the movement of groundwater as, a, as you have precipitation, it's coming down the mountains and right, you're able and it, to... And it, and it tends to uh, have some contaminants in it. So with the, with the airborne and, or in, and we hope spaceborne surveys, we can see where the point sources of that groundwater are, and then you can send a scientist or a graduate student down to sample that water to, to see if there's any hazards in it. Oh, okay. Okay, now, but when you talk about hazards, you're talking about sort of chemical-based hazards. Right, like it might be agricultural runoff, mm -hmm. or there might be some legacy uh, chemical plant uh, problems, uh, th those kinds of things. Well, because, um, for example, on the Big Island, one of the issues ha or their discussion has been, are pigs, you know, is pig poo creating yeah. a problem yeah. with the reefs? 
Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that was sort of a, a question mark. Uh, was this caused by the pig poo? Is it caused by fertilizers? Yeah. Uh, you know, they're doing uh, GMOs or operating in areas around on, on the various islands here. Uh, doing and and there's some commentary that that's not, that they dump a lot of chemicals yeah. as part of their their seed growing process. Yeah. And so is that impacting you know our crops? Is this the kind of technology that would help to determine those types of issues? Well, our, our little piece of the and puzzle, I, and I tried to relate it to us uh, yeah. here in Hawaii. A little yeah, our, our little piece of the puzzle um, that we, it's ongoing research is that we're able to detect where the groundwater comes out. Um, very strongly. Now, some, some of us can know this, uh, you know, along a Kalaniana Oli Highway, if you go off, offshore off the, the firehouse there, you can feel groundwater coming out when you get in the water. It's, it's cold, you can mm -hmm. even drink the stuff out underwater. But knowing where every single spot of that is on the whole big island, that, that, that's a tough job. So what the, the airborne and, and, like I said, hopefully spaceborne thermal mapping uh, we should be able to pr produce a, a, a map of where all of that groundwater is coming in the water. And that means you don't have to sample every little little spot or sample randomly. You can mm -hmm. say, okay, this is where it's really coming out strong. I'm going to sample that location. Maybe there's a, a agriculture up upstream from that. And I could potentially see some very life-saving opportunities here uh, with this type of mapping, especially in sub sub-Saharan environments where water is in short supply where you have populations that are looking for water, clean water sources, or where water is potentially being polluted. Yeah, uh, that you, you can, could imagine like um, in Lake Chad in, in Africa, which supplies millions of people with water, well, it's, it's down to something like a quarter of its former size. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a population is putting a lot of pressure on that lake. We can see, with this technology, we'd be able to see where those, those inputs are coming into that water. Because, you know, there, it, and I guess rivers shift. I mean, I remember when I was a child, the Arkansas River run, running through a small town that I lived in, and there was a big bridge because there was a lot of water. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been water there for years. Yeah. Um, of any, any substantial amount. And, uh, you know, the bridge is still there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no water going under it. You know. Well, there's a former student uh, in the geology department who worked with us on this airborne survey. Uh, she's at, uh, at uh, Georgia. Um, so, uh, Southern Georgia University. So she operates a system um, that we're putting together for her to uh, do river mapping, thermal mapping of rivers for exactly reasons like that, to see contaminants coming mm -hmm. in the water, uh, being able to, to, to better target the kind of analyses that are relatively expensive that f used to be done at random. So this is figuring out ways to do things more programmatically with a more myth a more me methodical approach, uh, which has a cost benefit to it. Yeah. So if you can if you can uh, use this kind of imaging technology uh -huh. to do a, a survey at relatively low cost, and then go in and target the kinds of things you want to do, it's kind of like going to the doctor and getting an MRI. Uh -huh. You know, the, he, that way he's not going to go do exploratory or surgery. surgery. <laughs> you know, he's going to look right. at the MRI, maybe run a couple uh -huh. of other tests, yes, and you yes. might be able to go home without any, uh, any operation So this is a sort of a, becoming a diagnostic tool in a oh, sense. Oh, definitely. Yeah, very definitely. cool. Yeah. I just love this stuff. This yeah. is actually, the, you know, technology is moving in such leaps and forwards today. I mean, yeah, the, it used to sort of move sort of like this, and today it just seems like it's just going straight up. Exponentially. Yeah. Exponentially, yeah. Uh, yeah. what we're able to accomplish. Uh, with the advent of uh, computer technology and uh, the silicon and silicon process, well, yeah. I guess we're not using even silicon any longer in our processors. Yeah, some some of them are, are more advanced materials. So yes, yeah. yeah. So it's just amazing what we're accomplishing. And then all this computer geeks still like writing code, all this stuff. But yeah. even writing code yeah. has gotten even more interesting these days because you yeah. have to write code against multi multi processors instead yeah. of a single yeah. processor. So it's yeah. changed the way we even do software development. Yeah, and scientists, uh, you know. Have completely embraced a lot of these changes. Uh, they're one of the original uh, programs that took advantage of, of sort of crowd uh, sourcing. The uh, analysis was called SETI at Home, which mm -hmm. was looking at radio signals, which was, there was too much data to an analyze, even with a supercomputer. So they uh, marketed, this is about 10 years ago, they marketed a, uh, a screensaver that would, would grab a little piece of data off the network, Mm -hmm. While you weren't using your computer, it would do the analysis and then send the results back 
uh, to the SETI Institute. I remember that. Yeah, yeah I remember that. And there, that. there are many other part. projects like that mm -hmm. which take advantage of the idle CPU time that's sit sitting on people's laptops. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's cool. I'm sure the NSA would love to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, they prob probably are. <laughs> they probably are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. I don't yeah. know if I want to have that conversation about the NSA. <laughs> yes, I, I, I show up on their no fly on the, on the yeah. no fly list. I talk about the NSA too much. So. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. anyhow, um, I want to talk about the commercialization aspect of what you do because I think this is, you know, you're a, you're. Your entity is also about taking technology that you're developing and figuring out ways to exploit it yeah. in more in a commercial sense as well. Yeah. Uh, because you know there are military applications that we're working on. We're not supposed to talk about. That. Uh, maybe I don't know if we're supposed to talk okay. about that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So but universities are working yeah. in, in tandem on military projects as well. So, but this all has also these technologies also have dual purpose. Yeah. So at, at UH in our research group, we've taken this technology that was really aimed at NASA, low power. Um, low weight sensors, mm -hmm. um, and we partnered up and, and stood up a startup for about five years now that that is trying to commercialize that through selling to government agencies um, the ability to do chemical detection without touching things. So the current mm -hmm. techni technologies typically are some somebody has to go up and swab something. You've probably seen that in the airport where they swab your hands That's and right. they put it through a through a scanner. Every time I go in, I don't know what it is about me. <laughs> <laughs> All the alarm bells go off. <laughs> I'm telling you, they see me, yeah. they come running with a yeah. swab. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what we're uh, trying to take this NASA developed technology and then uh, ap apply it to these these problems which we, the DOD calls it standoff detection so it'd be uh -huh. someone goes into a room has something that might look like a pair of binoculars they'll scan the room and say well there's uh, trace explosives in here or maybe there's a, a, a trace evidence of a, of a meth lab so we're sort of building our own version of a hound dog Kind of like that. Yeah. Kind of like that, except one that we can. We don't have to actually put that nose right up against the uh, the, the possibly dangerous substance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So well, mine. You know, of course, military application yeah. of something like that is mine detection. Yeah. You know, EIDs are a notorious you know uh, problem in combat zones, and so if a, if I were an EOD guy and I didn't really want to have to get up next to that thing with my little scanner thing, and I could stand back a little ways. I'd feel much better about my job, and maybe I could actually get a life insurance policy. <laughs> 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 High risk guy, you know, yeah. so, but uh, I can see the value of that technology. Yeah, and, and in fact, we've been working on detecting buried landmines at UH for a long time, since the early 90s, and, mm -hmm. and there, are, there are technologies out there that use the research that, that we did. You don't have buried landmines at UH, though. I just want to make that clear. Uh, uh, th we have. Uh, <laughs> tried to detect them, and there are none there. You haven't there. found any out there. Okay, no, all right, no. great. Uh, well, I love what you're doing. Um, now, um, how did this sort of, what I'm interested in as a, as a business person, right, I'm, I'm interested in how do you sort of coalesce something like this and get this going? Because like, if I had an idea or I wanted to, to sort of coalesce an idea into and develop something commercially, I, I think that would be a very interesting topic for somebody who's, who, who has that kind of interest. Yeah, well, at UH, we have an office called the Office of Technology Transfer and Economic Development, mm -hmm. which helps uh, small companies uh, form at UH. Uh, there, there's another uh, uh, UH entity called the Accelerator, which is, uh, helps uh, small startups mm -hmm. they get going. Um, we started mostly before those efforts uh, stood up. Now, so are these, who's capturing, like, you, for example, if you're developing new, uh, new patent, something that's patentable. Yeah. Who's capturing that patent? Or is that captured by the university? Or is that captured more by the people who did the work? Or is it a partnership type of scenario? How does that normally Well, at, the, at the university, if you're a university you know, employee, there's a mechanism that the UH will help support you to help get that patent. You, you share the patent rights. Okay. Um, so you, you're not uh, taking any financial risk on, on your own. Mm -hmm. So UH will, will typically cover the, the the initial disclosure cost and then as a team effort you you try to find a partner who will will put up the the patent cost and so that's what we we did what you do okay yeah. all right we're going to take a commercial break we'll come back let's talk a little bit more about this because this sounds like yeah. a very exciting area which we have really not explored so much okay okay Great. i'm chris letha with think tech hawaii today's guest is dr paul lucy 
and we're talking about sensors and research, and we'll be right back. Aloha. Aloha, my name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii, as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Ha! How you doing? It's here, Angus McSenta. Here to talk to you today. <laughs> anyway, but here we are to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and also just to tell everybody and remind you all to please watch the show with Drew the Security Guy, Gordon the Texar, and our wonderful guests on Hibachi Talk every Friday and also on YouTube. Just check it out. Just do a search out there. You can see it. You know, have a Merry Christmas and remember, should old acquaintance be <laughs> forgot and never come to the Anyway, have a Merry Christmas. Zuri and Nick, thanks a lot for everything you do for us. Drew. What's up? Aloha. Aloha. See you later. Bye. Hi, and we're back for our last segment of, uh, of our show today with Dr. Paul Lucy on sensors and research here at Think Tech Hawaii. And we're having a really great and interesting conversation because you, you guys are just, I mean, doing amazing stuff. You're right out of Big Bang Theory with all the sort of weird <laughs> and wonderful that uh, talking about all these different types of technologies that you're developing. Uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of theor theoretical work being done that you're building off of. Yeah, I mean, w uh, what we try to do at our, in our institute is uh, we see a scientific measurement need. We try to fill that with, with technology. Mm -hmm. So there's many folks in our, our institute that, that develop new technologies. For example, we, uh, we do a lot of uh, work with laser remote sensing, which is sending out a laser pulse and, and mm -hmm. seeing how the environment reacts to that and uh, getting uh, data back from that. Usually that didn't quite, for in my case, lasers usually mean I get a traffic ticket. And <laughs> I, <laughs> when, I, when I encounter a laser, yeah. it's generally not in my, on the best of terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we're, um, uh -huh. uh, we've got a, a, a group, uh, Dr. Uh, Anupam Misra and Dr. Uh -huh. Shiv Sharma, who are actually on a Mar the next Mars rover project. They've been working on using laser techniques and uh, they're on a team that will uh, be on the next Mars rover that you shine a laser on, a, on, a, on an object and it gives you a, a basically a fingerprint of the chemicals that are present there. And this is something that Mars scientists have been really crying out for. Wow. Because now, are lasers multi-spectrum now? I mean, you run through multiple spectrums. When I think of a laser, I think of something that operates One on a single wavelength. spectrum. Yeah, well, there's an interesting physics phenomenon that, that we exploit is if you, if you shine a laser, which is just one color, mm -hmm. very pure color, onto a, a, a chemical, it, the, the uh, radiation interacts with the chemical in such a way that the light that gets scattered um, has a certain amount of its energy shifted to other wavelengths depending on the chemical there. So you measure the spectrum of this pure laser light, you see a a lot of light from the just the, the so laser, but you see other wavelengths that depend on the chemicals. So, so it's, it's like a, a splash. So it's like a, a splash effect. And, and it's a colorful splash. Effect. It's a colorful splash. Yeah. So that's one thing. But they are developing uh, lasers that you can tune in mm -hmm. wavelength. That's, that's a popular technique for studying gases in the Earth's atmosphere, where they tune the laser to uh, an absorption feature of the gas, and uh -huh. then they tune it off, and they subtract those two to, to look at the actual signal. Wow, that's just amazing yeah. stuff. That's yeah. just when you guys hit it, like you all get excited when you when you figure this oh, stuff yeah. out. Oh yeah, I mean, is it like bring out the champagne? Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the original techniques were, were developed like a hundred years ago, uh -huh. Nobel prizes. But uh, for example, that that method, that color splash that that we were talking about, yeah, that really took a high power a technique like the laser to really make practical, and that and that and that's something that. Uh, You've been able to do that in the laboratory for almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. but now the lasers and our, our methods are good enough that we can do this at, at a distance, out, out to you know, tens, of, tens of meters. Um, 
I, I'm involved in a project, a NASA project that's in orbit around the moon right now where there's a, a laser altimeter where they measure the, the, the delay of the light pulse from the spacecraft to the ground. Uh -huh. But we also measure the strength of the light pulse, uh, which is proportional to the reflectivity of the ground. And uh, so we... That was a mouthful, by the way. Just so yeah. you know, that was proportional, uh, to, proportional to the... the reflectivity. <laughs> That's my my students say too. Okay, smaller words and less rapid. Words. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So we uh, uh, so this project is to measure um, how bright the moon is in um, permanently shadowed regions at the lunar poles where we think ice might be trapped on the moon. On the moon. So you 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 can bring your coke with you and have a little ice with your coke. Well, that would be good. Yes. The idea though, okay. the, the excitement about that is that if. If uh, humans return to the moon, you uh, you don't have to haul all the fuel up and supplies. Because you can Earth. convert. You can convert this water. If there's ice there, you can uh -huh. convert the water to rocket fuel and to uh, to oxygen for breathing. So that's the excitement. It's it's if there's sufficient ice there and it's mm -hmm. still an active area of research, then and still have ice left over for your coke. For your coke. Yes. Yeah. And, and whatever else that you drink with your coke. Uh, yeah. Yes. That's very cool. Now. Um, is that, is the, but there has yet to be a determination on that. Uh, there, the, the, the moon's being really tough about ans us answering this question. We've, we've brought a lot of tools to bear, mm -hmm. and they're, they're coming up with a lot of maybes. And some people say, yeah, add enough maybes together, isn't that a yes? And, and the, the pessimists say, yeah, add a lot of maybes together, and that's a you no. You know, when my mother used to tell me maybe, it usually yeah. meant no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Was there a way of telling me no? <laughs> what did it going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so well, that's well, a very interesting, that's a very interesting phenomenon, because then you're trying to, you're trying to discern the, 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 I guess, probability of something yeah, like that. But a, you don't really know until you get there, I suppose. It's like a mining problem yeah. where uh, you've got a lot of indirect methods but uh, to actually know you got to you got to set up that drill rig and, and mm -hmm. drill and that costs a certain amount of money yes and the chain has a certain probability of success and, mm -hmm. and it's, but it's going to it's going to take going down on the surface and so we may have point. to put astronauts back on the moon, but we've got to solve robot. our we've yeah. got to solve our space shuttle problem. Or I mean, our our, uh, our uh, rocket problem right now. We still don't have rockets in the United States since we closed down this the space shuttle program. Well, uh, interestingly enough, they'll be the first U.S. built return to space in uh, with people with people in a couple of years. So uh, both SpaceX and Boeing are have mm -hmm. capsules in development, and they're. They're both launched, uh, scheduled for launch in 2017 to the International Space Station. Okay, now is it going to take real life people or is this going to be people. a test run? Real, real life people. Yeah. Okay, so we're doing all the testing on these rocket systems today. Right. Okay. So they're, and they're in, in, a, in a very advanced state now. They're, they're, uh, NASA just signed the last checks. You know, NASA's paying for it. It's a private right. outfit, but they're getting government contract. Yeah, the rest of us are going to get that bill too, sure, yeah. I'm sure, sure enough. Yeah. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is very cool. So, but I want to yeah. talk a little bit about, more about the commercialization sure. aspect of this, because I think, you know, the ability to take this technology and find new civilian sources. One thing I thought about was farmers, you know, looking at crops and uh, chemical makeup in yeah. their, in their fields. What's going to help them to make a determination what crops to grow or crops that they can't grow, or if they yeah. need to do some sort of mineral replacement before they can grow yeah. crops? A agricultural remote sensing is a huge business. Yes, um, and it's that's a heavily competed huge huge business. It's not something that we we do at UH principally because it's really done very well by by industry right now. Mm -hmm. it, there's uh, there's always some more research to be done. I'm a scientist, so I can always ask another question. Yes, but in terms of what does a farmer actually need to know? That, that's a pretty well understood uh, problem now. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the commercialization access, access, uh, act, you know, aspect is really, um, how do you do that economically? If you have to fly a plane and that's all like mm -hmm. gas and all that kind of things, but drones are- Drones are, are coming in Totally big, changing yes. that the agriculture remote sensing business. Uh -huh. So small lightweight sensors on a, on a quadcopter can survey a, a, a field very inexpensively. Yes. Now I remember as a child, we had to go up in planes to find cows that got out. We had to go up in small Cessnas really? to go look for cows. When the cows got out, yeah, I remember yeah. doing that as a kid, that's, that's, and uh, that's we were we were cool. given a window and we were given an area and we were to look for that as those cows. Yeah. Now we can use hovercraft to go look for our, 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 our tuna <laughs> cows. <get> out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now we got to figure out how to get the hovercraft to bring the cows back home again. You know? yeah. That's the part we haven't quite figured out yet. 
But uh, this is very I heard very they, don't like, they don't like drones. They're not you big on drones. Them. Them. <laughs> I think the uh, cows, you can chase them. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you yeah. know, it was, uh, it was interesting as, as kids because we used to herd cattle on, mo cattle on motorcycles and sheepdogs. Oh, that's, uh, that's yeah. pretty neat. That was pretty cool. Australian sheepdogs, which yeah. are amazing animals. But yeah. uh, I love the idea of what you're working on. And when you talk about uh, going back to sort of commer commercialization, do you publish this stuff somewhere so people can go look at it and maybe they go, wow, you can do this now, and oh my god, I've got an application for this? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, publisher parish is the, the, the business that we're in. So, mm -hmm. uh, But who reads these things? I mean, it's got to be smart people that reads this stuff. Well, the, for the... Um, the kind of work that, that we are commercializing, we, we tend mm -hmm. to publish in the engineering literature, and, and, uh, and there's you know, a lot of people read that literature just to see where the, the current technology is, is pointing mm -hmm. towards. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the NASA kind of thing, we publish that in scientific journals, and we, we help our colleagues read the papers, and, and sometimes they don't. Yeah, so, sometimes, uh, yeah. And we I score mean, each other, uh, scientists score each other on who reads their stuff, and it gets, you know, it gets cited, and you, uh -huh. some people don't do that well, and some people do super well. And well, I'm sure that you have your rock stars within that, oh, in this world. Oh, absolutely. People, you know, well, if he, if he writes it, I'm going to read it, but if this other guy, yeah. is he's sort of, you know, yeah. uh, sort of on the fringes, unless he's got something really interesting to say. Yeah. But I'm sure you sort of fall, fall uh, victim to that same sort of mindset where... People are some people are followed more than others. I think it's like it's like any kind of a brand, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that you, you if you establish a reputation for for value, um, and you don't pu publish a, a low quality material, then mm -hmm. uh, people will will read your stuff. Yeah, and if it's succinct and I suppose easy to digest, uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, which I'm sure yeah. not of it, none of it's a lot really of it's super tough, easy to tough, digest. Tough, uh, it's just a tough, tough read. sliding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But you know, the people who uh, write well, that that. That makes a difference, also. Yeah, I would, I would think and so. And self promotion. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. A lot of a self promotion going on. Well, it's um, you know, every time we have a scientific conference, it's an opportunity to speak to your colleagues, a big audience, and, mm -hmm. and show them the good stuff you're doing. And it's basically a an ad. It's a big show and tell. Yeah. Sh show and tell session. Yeah. Talk about all this. Well, we exchange. We just ca I just came back from San Francisco. A uh -huh. huge conference there for geophysicists and. I think it was about 5,000 people, My and uh, you, you, you make a lot of contacts, you exchange information, and uh, you know, the all product just, get, just gets better. So where, if, if I were somebody that were interested in, in, as a student, let's say, I'm interested in what you're talking about, but I'm trying to decide between UH and maybe some other facility, um, who would I talk to? Where would I, where would I begin? Well, it depends on the field, but if, if you were in... Uh, in planetary science, mm -hmm. um, you because I know you're recruiting. I mean, you're looking for the best. Oh, no, we always brightest. do. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, the, we get we get hit from students all the time. They email us. Uh, they they you know they'll um, they you know they might see something on the web. They might see a news article. They'll they're they're really good at, at tracking down. Uh, well, I'm interested in Pluto, or I'm interested in the, you know the poles of the moon, and then so they do their Google search, and they then they they, they find you, and then. And we have to pitch them you know, mm -hmm. to see if they're interested in coming. It's a mutual, mutual kind of a kind of a thing. I, it's a big decision on the part of the students because when you come in as a graduate student, this is after you've graduated from college, mm -hmm. you tend to get tracked into where whatever you did your PhD on. So it's yes. a it's a huge commitment. Um, and for a twenty year old, that's that's something they don't typically think about. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, have a, I have a daughter who started studying neuroscience when she was 12. She developed an interest in neuroscience, and so she went and well, got that's, her... that's great. Yeah, so she's got a bachelor's in yeah. neuroscience now, but she's like... Yeah. And, but she's also a ballerina, so she's doing the ballerina, ballerina yeah. track right now, but at some, yeah. some point she'll move on. But yeah, one of the things that she's already being interviewed by people to can you continue working at, in, that, in, the, in the realm of neuroscience. Yeah, it's, it's great if you've got a kind of calling there. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's really... Uh, but she's... You know, she's getting talked. Different people are pitching her about coming to, to study yeah. with them, and uh, she's uh, she's excited about it, but she's just not ready to to jump. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it's it's an interesting world. Yeah. I I um, I know that the work that you're doing is important for the planet. It's important for the well-being of all of us. Yeah. Well, we 
We hope we're given value for all the mm -hmm. generous amount of money we're given. Yes, well, yeah. you know, we, we have a responsibility to return the Earth to the next generation yeah. Yeah. Uh, in better condition than when we received it. So far, we have not lived up to that, <laughs> to that standard, yeah. and we need to start doing a better yeah. job. But although I say that, um, I think that there is light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah, and just think of, you know, there's so many fewer people in poverty than it used to be. That, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of progress being made in a lot of areas. We definitely need to work on the, uh, That's right. the keeping the room clean. Someday we'll all drive Teslas. And then, and that uh, would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I think we can start with you and me. <laughs> That's right. We can just, we'll form the line formed here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. it was really great to have you on the show today, Paul. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, and, it, was, and, uh, it was fun. Uh, nice to have you here Thanks on Think lot, Tech. Um, you know, I, I love coming on to the studio here and talking about mm -hmm. things that, different things that people are doing in, in the science and, and research world because yeah. it just seems that we are moving it at such an exponential pace yeah, today. Yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, and it, one of the things I am an advocate for is getting young people engaged yeah. in the technology space. And, and girls especially, you know, I would see more girls and bring in a little yeah. bit more of a balance. I think they have a lot to add to the, to the equation. Yeah, and the NASA business, uh, when you go to a meeting now, it, it's got to be at least half. The, the, the younger generation uh -huh. is at least half female. It's, it's really great. That's exciting. We get, I think we have more than half female graduate students at, at UH and our, our business, too. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, we'll put out a good word for everybody. Yeah. And I'm Chris Leatham. Uh, thank you again, Paul, for being on the show. I'm Chris Leatham with Think Tech Hawaii. Thank you for being here. And uh, we'll be back next week for more. Aloha.